All right. There's some more right now. Uh, da -da. Okay, Christoph Zawinski, your email is too long. It made me change my, my setup for being excessively long. So um, this is Cliff, obviously. This is me wanting to talk about compilers with whoever, language runtimes, GCs, garbage collection, I don't know, concurrency, any, any sort of thing to do with implementation of execution of languages. Um, Oh, I got more people coming in. This is being recorded. Uh, ah, here we go. Um, oh, and and uh, Willemine Lestum, I don't know how to pronounce that. Would you send me a private chat with your email so I can associate Zoom names with emails? Um, this is a, uh, this meeting's being recorded. Uh, And I will put them up. It took about past bedtime last night for the email to, to for the email for, for the for the Zoom to record the video. Thank you there. Um, so it might be a little. So I'll put up last night's meeting today pretty soon, and then we'll put this one up an hour or two later, depending on how it goes. Uh, obviously, people are still showing up at a pretty good clip, so we'll wait another minute, and then Dennis will do a short presentation. Um, and then we'll just go to open Q&A, the usual discussion format. Uh, what else? Mute, mute yourself if you're not talking because we get too many mics that are open. It makes too much background noise. It's gonna be a busy meeting here. Um, it's an open mic policy. Stop and ask questions anytime. Uh, you know, reserve the right to moderate, but that's not been necessary. Um, in particular, uh, just to help everyone understand where we're at, my assumption is that we're all fairly expert in the language compiler code gen side of things. So that goes more or less true with different people. Um, but we all at least have a clue what a performance counter is and why they exist. Um, and so just as a, as a help to, to setting, uh, where the discussion might start from. And if that's not true, then feel free to ask questions and say, hey, wait a second, because I often make assumptions about what people know and sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong. Sometimes I guess too low and sometimes I guess too high. Um, okay, so uh, maybe one more minute. I, I'm still pulling in like three people a minute here. So let's, let's wait one more minute and then, and then we'll take off. I hope everyone's having a good, uh, you know, a good, coronavirus staycation. <laughs> okay, so let me click, uh, pull up the slides real quick. Oh, and can you please uh, allow me to, to share? Oh, screen share, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. na, 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 na. Um, okay, see what happens now. All right, now works. Yeah, sorry, my, my very first attempt at this thing, I had porn bots show up and immediately they would instantly automatically screen share porn <laughs> and uh and you know and i kept kicking people out and they would come back in it took me a while to uh sort out the, the right level of uh i don't know what it takes to keep keep it sane here hasn't been an is issue there a so recording of that i'm sorry <laughs> is there a recording of that first meeting no, sorry. Oh, darn. But I, I think you could go to Pornhub and find the same stuff. <laughs> For a while, python.com was a very uh, rich uh, porn site. And <laughs> go there instead of python.org. And at a community college where I was teaching, I asked the people to actually block that. Normally, I'm against blocking, but they did that for me. There was always a White Is House. the official com. website of python.org? Is that yeah, python.org is the official one, but python.com is where someone might go if they didn't. Yeah, know the didn't website. grab enough domain names when they when they were buying their domain names. Apparently, yeah. same thing. Same thing with the White House because you had WhiteHouseGov and WhiteHouse.com, 
and the oh. calm was the calm was a big surprise for people. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> Okay, Dennis, why don't you go ahead and take off here? I think we're, we're ready to go. Yeah, sure, why not? So, so th thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Dennis. I'm, I work at, uh, at Intel. Uh, we're doing C++ compiler development. Um, and you know, actually, so yesterday we had an interesting discussion and I, I see a lot of you folks are, are interested in uh, virtualized environments and you know, sort of a, a distributed systems. Um, that's not my primarily uh, area of expertise and, and where I use performance counters. So, so uh, today um, I want to show just, you know, just, just, just share like my uh, experience with, with performance counters and where I use them, which happens to be primarily in, uh, in you know, um, in applications and workloads that work on a, on a single socket and usually, you know, they're, uh, um, uh, written in native languages, so C, C++, and sometimes even Fortran. So, yeah, okay, let's start. Um, so, uh, uh, what are, uh, so, uh, as Cliff said, right, uh, I don't know as well uh, what uh, what every, uh, and, uh, and, uh, how every person uh, is experienced with performance counter. So I will quickly go through the, the slides that I have on, and maybe then, then you, you can feel feel free to to steal the discussion in 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 in, in whatever direction you want. So, all right, Why? okay. Um, so, CPU mental model. So this this is uh, the basic uh, CPU mental model that one might have. We we uh, inside the CPU inside the modern CPU we have caches. We have branch predictor. We have the execution pipeline. Then we have the clock generator that so, sort of, you know, send pulses and makes everything goes to the next stage. So if we add just a little bit of silicon, we can build a hardware register. If we will wire it up to the clock generator, we can count cycles. When, well, count cycles is great, but not too impressive, right? Um, so if we add, if we add a little bit more wires, uh, and connect it to, to uh, other units in, in, in a system. Uh, we can have a counter which can count cache misses, branch mis predictor, uh, branch mis mis prediction, sorry, and some interesting uh, events in, in the pipeline, like instruction retired and, and so on and so forth. So notice now we also have configuration register, right? Because now we need a way to tell which event we want to count. Then uh, if we want to count multiple events at the same time, we obviously have multiple of, 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 of counters. Well, in, in fact, we actually have the four uh, PMCs, uh, programmable PM, PMCs, not, not three. So on, 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 this, on, on this slide, uh, I'm showing three, but in reality, uh, uh, there is more. So we can control individual uh, counter, for example, when we want to say which event we want to count. And then there is a global uh, uh, register which controls all of them at once. So let's say we, we want to disable counting or enabling all, all, all the counters at once. So then there is a, a performance monitoring unit in, in, in all the modern CPUs. Um, uh, there are multiple hardware features but today we only will talk about performance monitoring counters, the ones that are uh, highlighted in yellow. So uh, there is a, uh, an important distinction here to be, to, to be made, right? So the first is the, the, the counters, like the physical counters itself, uh, themselves, uh, there are actually only, o only seven of them, so not much. But on the left side, on the left-hand side, we have performance events, and there are hundreds of them. So events are, well, uh, sort of, you know, uh, so th they are not physical, right? So uh, we, we can, we, we, we have a lot of performance events available to count, but we uh, only can count so much at, at, at a time, okay? So, and this is how you can query your PMU. Um, uh, notice on this slide that the number of fixed counters is three. And this is typical for, for all modern hardware uh, in new generations, there will be more, but uh, this is not the topic of today's uh, uh, session. Yeah, 
and then the number of programmable counters is four. So we we we, uh, we always have uh, th three performance events measured for free. Those are usually instructions retired, uh, a reference clock, and 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 CPU clock. So th those events are measured uh, always automatically free for us. And then we we can choose what other events we want to measure by using the four programmable counters. So those uh, performance counters are implemented as uh, MSRs, as model model specific registers. So you 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 cannot rely on them being present in particular uh, CPU generation. So you should always query first. Uh, you can access those MSRs with uh, read MSR and write MSR instructions. Those instructions are ring zero instructions. It means that you can only access them from privilege code. Um, what else I should say? All right. Yeah. So 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 now. Uh, uh, what 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 can we do with those counters? Well, usually uh, there are a number of, of of different approaches, and the first one is counting. Well, we can count some performance events, right? And the the idea is pretty simple. We just uh, count, for example, how how many instructions retired were in in a particular workload. So we set the counter to zero at the beginning. We configure the event we want to count. We want to measure. We enable the counting and we let the benchmark go. At the end, we disable the counting and we read the values. Uh, so, so th this is actually how perf stat is working. Uh, we just just gather some absolute numbers for for for, for the workload. This is important piece, um, though. It, it it is used for workload characterization, for example, in uh, in TMA, which I will talk about later. And the second is is probably the more uh, popular way of using uh, performance counters is sampling. Uh, some people call it profiling. Um, it, it probably they, they basically mean the same thing, but uh, uh, generally speaking, profiling is, is is a more broader term. Sampling is 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 the process where where you try to understand, identify the hotspots in a program. Um, so uh, the idea is that. Uh, you, 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 so, so this is how it works. So you, so you set the counter to count, for, for example, some event, let's say cycles for, for, for simplicity. And you initialize the counter with, with, with some number n. I, I will talk about a little bit later what this n means. So then you enable the counting and, and you wait until the counter overflows. So uh, remember we, we count in cycles, right? So this counter will be incremented every cycle. So eventually it will overflow. And when it will overflow, the hardware will raise the interrupt. This is called the PMI, the uh, performance monitoring interrupt. So inside our interrupt service routine, not our, but this is actually the workflow, how the typical profiling tool works. So uh, the, 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 the profiling tool will catch this interrupt. And inside the interrupt service routine, it will, it will disable the counting it will capture the IP. This, this is probably the, the most important piece here. So we, we capture instruction pointer where in the code the the interrupt happened. So the, this is this will be our first sample, okay? And then we set the counter to, to this number n and we let the benchmark go again until we get another sample and, uh, and until we get another interrupt, another overflow, another sample. So the, uh, if we build enough of uh, enough collection of samples we can build a histogram that's shown actually at the bottom. So this is exactly the process where what uh, perf record is following, right? So the more samples uh, get tagged, uh, get attributed to a particular function, the more hotter the, the function is, right? So this is how we build the Dennis, histogram. Can you set yeah, sure. that, Dennis, can you set the counter something other than cycles? To yeah, absolutely. On on cache misses. Absolutely, sure, yeah. Okay. And this is actually the, the really important piece in, in, in TMA, in, in uh, top-down uh, microarchitecture analysis, but I, 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 I will actually have an example later, yeah. But you can. You, you can you can sample on cycles, you can sample on, on, on cache misses, you can sample on branch misprediction. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not, uh, it's not Im immediately obvious why do you want to do this? <laughs> 
but uh, yeah, I, I, I actually ha ha have an example even, even in my slides next. All right. A any other question? Actually, feel free to interrupt me at any time you want. Roll on, roll on. Sure, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. So this is how you manually collect uh, a particular counter. So you, you, you should look up in the manual. Uh, there's a giant table uh, in the chapter 19 in volume three uh, of the SDM uh, software developer manual uh, that Intel publishes. Um, so to, ma to, to collect, you should, uh, you, you should get two numbers. First, the event number that's on the left in, 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 in hexadecimal and the mask value. So you provide this in the perf, uh, perf, perf command like, like shown below. But the, the good thing here is actually you don't have to, to memorize all those numbers. Uh, for, for, for a major part of counters, Perf provides the mappings, the, the human readable mappings for, 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 for the counters. And actually, they, they actually look uh, like, uh, so their names are like, you know, re resemble the, the, the name of, of the counter itself. So it's, you, you, you shouldn't memorize them. Really, you should just run perf list and grab probably the output for, for the counter you're looking for. But yeah. So let me actually go real quick through, 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 through the rest of the slide. So this is what happens uh, when, you, when you have to multiplex between different events at the same time. So suppose we want to count eight performance events, d different events simultaneously, right, at the same time. Well, you, you only have four programmable counters available per logical thread. So what, what you have to do? Well, you have to multiplex them in the runtime, right? So you switch. You, you, you divide your events into groups of four and you switch, switch between them um, in runtime. So this is, uh, this is again, what, what the profiling tool will do if you, if you will ask it to count uh, more than four events at the same time. All right, and this is how, how it looks in the timeline. So, well, obviously when you multiplex them between, uh, between them in the runtime, you will not count uh, all events during all the time, right? So eventually to understand the, the uh, to get the estimate of how much uh, total events uh, were ha happened during the run of the benchmark, you have to scale this number. So for example, if, if, if one counter were, were, was enabled during 50% of the time, so you have to scale it by two, right? To get the, uh, the approximate uh, the uh, approximate number of total events. I think we so, got the I think we got the concept here. Sure. Yeah. So then the the concept uh, of collecting call stacks. This is this is also pretty much uh, important concept. So this is uh, to understand uh, what is the most the most frequent caller of particular function. So this is this, this is actually really really useful when you when you see the, for example the mem copy as the top hotspot. Well, I mean you know. Uh, pretty much all the all the workloads use mem copy, but uh, but uh, so you you have to understand why mem copy appear in the hotspots in the first place. So to do to to understand that you have to know what 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 are the most frequent callers of of of, of mem copy, and this is the idea, right? So so um, uh, and I, uh, pro, uh, profiling tools are usually collect the call stacks with every sample that that they get. So, uh, and you can do this in multiple ways. You can use last branch record. This is probably the most lightweight uh, um, collection. You can use the frame pointer registers. It's all, all, although it's not so popular these days, you can use debug information. Uh, although it, it requires that you build your uh, workload with, with the debug information. All right. But then probably the, the sweet spot. Uh, TMA, top-down microarchitecture analysis. All right. Um, so uh, it, the, the idea of, 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 the, of this is actually to abstract away the knowledge of performance counters from the user that, you know, that even inexperienced uh, the developer can, can, can use the, this type of analysis and, you know, and, and efficiently find, find the CPU bottlenecks in the workload. So the idea is that you only get get a limited number of counters, let's say for example, four counters 
and you collect them in, in, in uh, during the run of your benchmark, and you identify the CPU bottleneck at a high level. So, so for example, first you take the four counters and you collect, uh, and you, you collect some statistics, and you understand whether my workload uh, is bounded by memory, by by front end, by CPU front end, whether it, there there are a lot of branch misprediction and so on. Once you identify that, you actually drilling down by 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 using the another set of of, of counters. So and then you you drill down, for example, and you you know well okay. So now I see that 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 my benchmark is bounded by let's say by uh, last level cache, right? So a lot of a lot of memory requests go into memory in, in into the main memory. So so now you, you you know where to look for. Um, so this is the concept. So again, the, the the good thing here is that the tools are automatically choosing counters. You don't have to know anything about the counters. You don't have to know how to collect them. The tools will do this all by themselves. I, I got a question. What's branch sure. re-steers the middle of the bottom? Uh, that's uh, branch re-steers. Yeah, under I, I, I actually, inbound, fetch latency, branch re-steers. Yeah, I see. I, I actually, I, I, I can't answer it <laughs> right now. But there is there is probably uh, some some you know some exceptional situation that can happen. Uh, branch. Somehow it deserves a slot on the yeah. TDMA here. Yeah. So it's not. Somebody thought it was less exceptional. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually. So you know, I I can't answer, but there's probably uh, some some uh, some group of of uh, uh, you know some specific scenario in which that happens. Yeah, I, yeah. I, if you sure. find something out, throw it out on Twitter or send me an email or chat or something, be fine. But if you don't, don't worry about it. Yeah. I actually, no, I actually, so I, I, sh I, should, have, I should have probably posted the link to the d description of, of, of for, for all of them. Uh, yeah, so, so you, 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 you can find the description for every group, for every okay. bucket, yeah. Uh, okay, people are busy on chat here. So, so if you get up with a link, you can throw a link out. I see Christoph throwing out a link. Oh, oh. rebranch re-steers. There you go. ARC 60. What's ARC 64? Matt, what's... Hey. Hey, so open question, maybe anyone in the audience knows, is there anything close or comparable to this performance counter hierarchy for 64-bit ARM or AR64? Uh, there is an equivalent to the PMU, uh, but I don't know exactly which data there is in there. Yeah, exactly. I know there are performance counter definitely, but I am not aware of any kind of hierarchy that we see here, like in top-down microarchitecture analysis, where we can first see whether it's stalled or not, and then determine whether it's memory or whether it's execution unit and on and on. Good question. I, yeah, I, I like this presentation. This part I haven't seen before. I mean, I saw some of it last night, but it's, this is new to me. <laughs> Right, that's cool. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, so, roll on. Let's keep sure. going here. Sure. And yeah. We go switch to QA so, here in a minute. Sure. Yeah. So this is actually the the example of of TMA in practice, right? So so the VTune has this microarchitecture expo exploration analysis, uh, and uh, on on this slide you can see. So the, 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 this is some compression be benchmark, and it bound. By, it, it, it's bound by bad speculation. So there are a lot of branch misprediction happening in this benchmark. We can clearly see, uh, you know, what is limiting our uh, our performance, right? Uh, we can do some 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 particular steps about it. So uh, here is actually what what will happen if you will click on branch mispredict. If you will just double click here, it will get you to the to the list of functions that, that contribute to uh, to the workload being um, being uh, bound by bad speculation by branch misprediction, you can see but uh, list of functions where uh, those misprediction happen, right? And then you, if if you if you actually also click on the function, it will get you to the source code level view. So it's really cool. 
uh, it allows you to see the particular line of code uh, where, you know, which experience uh, a lot of mispredicts, right? So, and, and then you can go about this, uh, you, you can you can try to eliminate the branch uh, on, on this, actually on, on this slide, it's not obvious that there is a branch, but there is, uh, there is a get bit macro that actually get expand into into a little bit more code. So yeah, I, I, I actually, I, I, I remember analyzing the, this benchmark. So yeah, it's, it's, it's actually, uh, it's, it's possible to, 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 to improve performance here and, 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 and eliminate some of branch predictions. And I guess that's all I have. We can now, you can now feel free to steal, steal the conversation or yeah, we can talk wherever we want. Hey, here, why don't you stop screen? Well, no, save it and roll backwards just as a, as a visual aid. Go back to your TMA top level view. So this one? I don't, well, I don't, I don't see it yet. Uh, that's a good one. Yeah. I thought I had something to say on it directly. I, you know, at Sun, I put together a thing that uh, dumped out perf counter numbers uh, with the jitted code, mapping it just like what VTune's doing. And then it got, got yanked and it's now under paywall as well. Um, you can get this for jitted code in Java. That's what I guess all you can come out of that one is. BPU part three, there's a bunch of stuff hitting the, hitting the chat here. I looked at the branch steers. that's all mispredict recovery. Um, after you've mispredicted and or run a bit, there's a separate thing from machine clear and mispredict there and what it takes to get the pipeline reloaded after a misprediction. So if you're reloading your pipeline, that's called branch re-steers. Mm -hmm. Don't know more than that. Usually the code I'm working on is more memory bandwidth bound. And so I'm, I'm mostly looking at things on the other side of things. Right, yeah. I actually, I actually haven't seen. Uh, to be honest, I haven't seen any work, any real workload that 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 has you know high number of branch steers. <laughs> so the, this is this is this is the answer why I don't know what 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 is branch steers. <laughs> no, that's fine. Yeah, the, the sort of the obvious thing is, um, you you have to make the silicon once. You're not certain what's going to work or not. You have a pretty good idea, but if something goes bad, it's hard to go diagnose, right? So if it's cheap to throw these counters in, you throw them in and then you figure out later, oh, 99% of the time is not here, never important, but I didn't know going in. I've done that all the time, you know, diagnose some piece of code, I don't know what the hell is fast or slow or whatever, I throw down counters everywhere. And then I print and sure enough, a bunch of things were wrong direction and they'll always be the wrong direction, but you didn't know, so you put them in. Um, here's yeah. arm counters. Okay. So um, it, it, seem, it seems like you, you have more or less the same things. Um, it's not in a hierarchy like this, but I think the hierarchy is just for the understanding of it, correct? Yeah. Um, I'm looking through the arm one now. Hey, Dennis. Uh, I was going to ask, um, related to um, these hierarchy of architectural uh, performance counters and so on, it used to be in the past that Intel, um, it was like I was maybe 15 years ago in a presentation where they actually thought us how to do this by hand, given you have all the performance counters. Uh, and so they'll tell you, you take... Uh, you know, your number of retired instructions and you compare it with this other counter and then you figure out this back install, you compare it with that and you kind of derive whether it's a front end issue or a back end issue or you have too few memory slots or things like that. Is there anything more updated related to this or is just kind of private knowledge embedded in VTM that gives you this kind of great stuff? Oh, you mean how to, how to calculate uh, all, all those buckets yeah exactly this is this is this is all free everything everything actually actually you know you, you don't even have to use vtune for for that uh, so the, okay. uh, the perf is now enabled uh, to do those kind of analysis as well 
Oh, so it does this kind of groupings. It knows yep. which ratios of counters to pick up and choose. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. So, so it's not it, it, it's not really Vitium specific. Uh, Perf can do uh, top down analysis as well. All right, cool. Yeah. And it should be applicable to other architectures, I guess. It was a question that was asked. They... I'm actually pretty sure AMD supports the four high level buckets, like retiring, bad speculation, front and bound, and back and bound. And, and the last time I checked, this is probably was about a year ago. So AMD supports all those four. Uh, but at the, at the time that I, that, that I checked again, it was a one year ago. AMD did not support anything more detailed than that. Mm -hmm. But maybe now they, they, they already support that. Yeah. So Nitola, you asked about the updated formulas for the TMA matrix. And if you go to this 01.org website, which is in Intel's website, there is a document, a spreadsheet called TMA matrix Excel file. And that has all of the formulas for all of those TMA matrix for all the microarchitectures of Intel right now. So this is the up-to-date place, I think, currently, for Intel at least. Exactly. That's, yeah. That's exactly what I was asking. Thanks so much. Yeah, one comment I have. Uh, so the thing I'm working on is, um, is optimizations for Java. And uh, I find myself self rarely looking into performance counters, uh, usually because there are a lot of high level things, which um, like the, the, op the missing optimizations and optimizations I work on usually are more high level. Like for example, you need to inline something, after that you can constant fall something, you can eliminate some part of the computation. And um, I'm curious if, um, if there is something useful I can derive from performance counters, uh, which could hint on, on the problems on a higher level optimizations. So, um, so way back in the day, we, we did a whole lot of stuff with things with performance counters that we had and co-generation on the Zool stuff and found there was lots and lots of opportunities that are sort of not obvious. So one of them was uh, your iCache is getting overrun because you have a bad layout of your hot code. And if you were to split your, your block of code, um, not by basic blocks, but by hot chunks versus medium and cold chunks. And then when it came time to install in the code cache, you kept the, the, you know, the aliasing relationship amongst the, the line alignment relationship amongst the code blocks. And then you put the hot code sequentially, it's going to land in sequential lines in your iCache as opposed to all landing on the same line and then evicting each other constantly. And the, the diagnosis for that was to look at iCache misses and decide that you had an issue and you know, and, and even just a stupid one better was to take somebody who was hot and just move the code and try again. So, so not even intelligently, but just a fucking random scramble with a little you know, bias offset got you off of the pothole where you were forcibly always missing. And that was driven by iCache misses. I was going to add uh, to that question. Uh, how do you currently decide if you if inlining is the next stream of work that you want to tackle? Right. So you, you could think of these performance counters as a way to um, kind of uh, aid your hypotheses. Right. So you do see, like like Cliff mentioned, iCache misses, and then it could be. Um, ping-ponging of the cache line or whatever aliasing or whatever issues, right? So, so your work in, in the JVM domain can be driven by these performance counters in a way, or, uh, or the priority could be, uh, could be designed based on the output of these performance counters. Well, but, but the problem is uh, it looks like this information is too low level for for many things uh, I will be looking at, or at least I don't have a good way to, to decode this, uh, like to indicate that ah, this is what I want to be doing. So for example, there might be some higher level optimization, which would lead to like elimination of some code paths completely. Uh, and how do I see this looking into performance counters? 
I, I have a question. I have an answer potentially for that, Arthur. Uh, I mean, one example that Monica was just saying for the iCash business, right? So if with this TMA analysis here, you see a front-end bound issue versus a back-end bound issue, you can then say, well, if I focus my effort on optimizing the layout of the code so that I can fetch instructions faster, um, then I will win at the end of the day, which means I have to bump up my inliner and do better with code layout in terms of branch prediction, make sure that everything fits better in the iCache for my program. If your backend bound application, which means your front end is doing well, is pushing enough instructions in, but the back end is unable to retire them fast enough, then you work on maybe data bound problems. Uh, things where you can optimize data, memory layout, say you modified the GC to put your objects in a better layout so you can execute more. Or so, better so break apart the notion of using performance counters to understand an existing workload in a classic, I want to do performance analysis and code generation optimizations from, I want to use them at runtime to dynamically change something on the fly. Uh, and those are sort of fairly different use cases um, and I'm not sure which one you're asking about in particular, but like, like if you're doing classic performance work, sometimes some loads will want X optimization, some will want Y, whatever those are, and the performance counters might help you diagnose what it's doing right now and then steer which way you go. If instead you want to do, I want to do something on the fly to dynamically adjust how the JVM is jitting code or executing code, um, you know, kind of want a different different understanding of what these things do because I have a limitation of how I'm going to sort of algorithmically change my code gen on the fly. There's a lot more limitations there. So, so um, I guess I'm asking, where, where are you at with yeah, this, the, Arthur? The, the thing I was asking initially is, uh, is just analysis, uh, like uh, offline analysis of, uh, of things yeah, okay. and looking for opportunities. Yeah, yeah. So, so there's a lot of, um, I see a lot of, I've done a lot of stuff, let me restate, restate that. I've done a lot of stuff with big data and machine learning. And so there's a lot of very large data sets and, uh, and a lot of garbage collection. So this is in the realm of Java and I, I rapidly get memory bound. And the sort of the number one optimization is to not allocate. Um, and, and that turns into escape analysis and it turns into rewriting your code that is looping through big data. So it, quits converting every freaking thing to a string because that will get you memory bound in a, in a real hurry. Um, I did that work with performance counters and without, but at some point it became obvious what the hell is going on. Uh, but yeah, there, there, there was something there. You could go diagnose and say, you are clearly memory bound. In fact, there you go. That, that, that was, this is where I was trying to get to. It is a case, and I know Kirk's seen this a lot too. It is a common case where people uh, fail to recognize the cost of garbage collection because it's guaranteed a cash mess. And so if you're endlessly allocating um, because your standard pattern is for every byte that comes over the file network, wherever it came from, I allocate two bytes for making it a string. Then I start to, to endlessly allocate and I just run out of memory bandwidth. Then I attach your kit and I go try to do program performance diagnostic work, your kit's not pulling out these perf counters. It reports that you're GCing a lot. All GC costs are infinitesimally tiny because a young gen GC on objects that are rapidly being produced and rapidly dying is, is really super cheap. And it will fail to diagnose the issue, which is you, you're being out of memory. Um, whereas if you turn around and then take that allocation pattern and reuse that memory in every iteration of the loop instead of allocating fresh, I get Integer factor speed ups like 5x very straightforwardly on uh, lots of things. So there's a giant gains to be had that do not show up on these standard sort of Java perf uh, performance analysis tools that do show up in these hardware counters. Yeah, I, 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 I could add to that. It's actually worse than that, Cliff. It's like, uh, you know, a lot of people will say, like, pull out your execution profiler mm -hmm. and, you know, profile for this thing using execution profiler. And it really is an execution issue on the allocation side uh, because you know you're doing something frequently and so you think an execution profiler which is tuned to pick up things you're doing frequently should pick it up and in some cases they do in a lot of cases they don't 
But even in the cases that they do, um, just the use of tooling leaves you in the mindset to not recognize that this is a memory issue and not really an execution issue. In other oh, words, I see. And all, all the numbers are still going to be in the floor, right? So you're going to be in the noise floor with all of these numbers. So you're going to look at it and say, hey, there's nothing I can really do about this because, you know, it's, you know the profile's effectively flat. The profile's flat, yes. So that's part of being out of memory bandwidth is every, everybody who touches memory misses constantly. And so your execution everywhere slows down and it's fairly flat. Um, and a perf counter will tell you you're you know, missing in your, your last level of cache constantly. Um, but a standard execution profiler will put hits all over the map. They won't be in some sort of hot place. Uh, and so it's very hard to diagnose it without recognizing that you're out of memory bandwidth. The other one, for the other red flag for that one is the garbage collector is running furiously and running very well. It's, it's garbage collecting constantly at a high efficiency rate in very short GC cycles. But if you look at your count of objects generated, you'll have like, it'll be through the roof. It'll be, it'll be enormous count of objects generated. And that's the, the bug, but the CPU, where the code, code execution profile will be all smeared out so it's actually worse than that because the memory profilers will lie to you also um, for a num number of different reasons um, so but mostly people will look at the volume allocated and um, really what you wanted to do is tune the allocation profiler to look at the frequency of allocation uh, and when you look at it that way then you can tend to see the problem most of the time um, but certainly looking at the hardware counter is you know just like it's you know, clear as, clear as mud once you, once you see that. There's a, there's a chat discussion for IPC as a proxy for out of memory bandwidth. Um, I, I, think, I think that's a, a, an interesting, it, it's a right direction. I think uh, Dennis's example of LZIP being branchy bound has a suck IPC as well, but he's actually branch mispredict bound as opposed to memory bound. So it's not it's not a not a not a such a free free heuristic, but it's not a bad direction. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. IPC, CPI, whatever. This is all in the chat, by the way, for people who haven't spotted the chat. Are there any tools that uh, like allow you to like track allocations to line numbers? Like is there any off the shelf tools? Oh yeah, totally. I mean, your kit will, I assume most folks will. Your, your allocation for Java 1, yeah, right. Yeah, 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 most of them do some sort of essentially statistical profiling. Every so many allocations, they take an interrupt from the JVM and they record the stack trace. So you get a, you get a stack trace, you get allocation swipe for stack trace, whatever, or, or you, get a, uh, you get a hot allocation profile for, for your code. Yeah, um, which disturbs the JIT. So even then, you have to look at the JIT to understand, you know, if you're actually looking at a true hot site or just something that's an artifact of the profiler being attached. You, yeah, you'll always suffer the profiler Heisen bugs. But if you're allocation bound and you attach a profiler, you, you sh should remain allocation bound. Like as far um, as I know, no JIT is so aggressively removing the sort of the major escape analysis tools such that a little bit of disturbing makes it fall over and quit doing that and that changes your profile. Here's I can tell if you're allocation bound, you're allocation bound. I've, I've, I've got some applications where that exactly that happens. Oh, I actually so kind of love to see the profiles on those. Uh, I, th I think you already have. Uh, you have a copy of one of them anyways, because I think we ran it on the old Azul hardware a while. But, uh, okay, I, I certainly don't have it now. I'd be interesting. Certainly at the time I ran it on Azul, it didn't matter because the GC on Azul is crazy. Right. Well, it mattered this time because we were around 40 gigs a second or something, garbage or something. It was weird. Anyways, uh, I'll, I'll flip it back at you and you can take a look. Do 40 gigs a second. That would be okay. Heat track. And yes, yeah, better profiling tools. CPP and, 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 and Java versus not the Java. 
this is okay. I, I whipped into your GitHub KDE heat track and I got a 404. This is not the web page you are looking for. Are yeah, you... you have to remove the parentheses and the dot. I blame Zoom. <laughs> oh gosh, I missed that. Ah, thank you. No, oh, bang, there it is. Fine. Heat track for. Is it due pro a process level allocation? But this will be not 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 gar, gar, GC. Yeah, that's for C and C plus plus. It's fairly decent in terms of attribution of fault. If you want to know yeah. a particular function or even a line of code to blame for yeah. the allocations, then it's actually pretty good to analyze the you heat. You want the stack trace to get a flame graph or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's pretty good for fairly okay. detailed statistics. Yeah, I'm looking at the pictures. That looks nice. Oh, I lost my, okay, oh, yeah, hang on, pop out, ah, interpreting heat, pro yeah, this is the wrong kind of profile though, I mean, wrong kind of heat, sorry, not for me, I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's very interesting to a lot of folks. Da -da -da. So what else? So a lot of a lot of very quiet folks. One of your earlier comments was uh, the difference between tooling and runtime. So it would be interesting to see, you know, some of these discussions be turned into a kind of a runtime angle on it. So, for example, you know, detecting a lower IPC, or being able to measure number of cycles spent in uh, allocation versus GC versus um, actual execution of code things like that. <clears throat> Having a cheap high resolution, you know, the TSC register like goes a long way to breaking out the software. I'm in the GC, I'm in the, I, I'm in, uh, you know, uh, safe point work on a solo thread. So you do a ragged safe point for your GC. It's still a pause, but it's per thread and how much time is spent there versus mutator execution. You know that that this kind of resolution on these counters is is gets into things you have to do with like the JIT. It's like you know, it's talking about reshaping the code. Um, I don't know that I've done very much dynamic code reshaping off of the JIT. The the, the spot of the iCache layout we turned into a static fix, not a dynamic one. That was that was offline hacking. I do things with CAS misses and reshaping concurrent data structures. Counting CAS misses is not quite a hardware performance counter. It's not that bad. Um, other things are just sort of obvious stuff. Post, I'm trying to think of what, what a good use case is for a perf counter to change how you would JIT code or how you would execute JIT code. Um, we did stack layout for better cache performance. That was offline. We did stack layout for TLB misses. That was offline. You should be able to do the iCache one, for example. Yeah, totally. The, the, the hack I ended up implementing was offline. The observation was that we could do this on the fly. Right. Um, and was there a significant resolution of information that you could actually see which lines or which right so um the the azul early azul setup was well these little boxes all of them the, the actual hardware ones we could capture uh instruction traces in real time um because we would just spew them out into the l2 and a separate hot core would burn them from one l2 to another and another hot core would compress them because they com these traces compress massively uh, and then, and then another hot core was writing them out to memory. So until you ran out of memory on the box, you could actually run a, an entire, actually it was an entire like clusters worth of, so eight cores running full speed using another eight cores to like record. Um, and you get these billion instruction live traces of everybody's interleavings. Once that was done, you run those traces through a simulator and you can get all kinds of fun layout issues exposed. 
so we did a lot of work with, you know, multi-billion instruction traces um, that we knew were live, actual, real traces. Uh, but we didn't have an on the fly. And from that, we would get L1 layouts. We totally got L1 layouts, which we turned into, you know, page coloring for stack frames, for instance, to avoid uh, a set of associativity issues because the L2 was, you know, four way on that Azul box with eight cores. Turns out you don't need that. You don't need all, like the difference between four and eight. Once you fix the obvious stupid things, is pretty modest. So it wasn't necessary to have an eight, or it wasn't a big performance hit. Except you must not have like your stacks perfectly aligned, running the same code all perfectly aligned. So you had to do page coloring on the stacks. Um, there were a couple other page colory things we did, and then and then the problem went away. And the L two low associativity wasn't an issue. But this was all done as offline analysis on giant traces. Um, on the fly, I don't know. You know, you could do page coloring for stacks on the fly, but I think Intel hardware has enough associativity that's not probably going to be an issue typically. If you have a one L2, you have more, more logical cores, then you have associativity in your L2, you can hit page coloring. But I, that, that's not the typical case for Intel. Um, I oh, cache yeah. layout, I think it's still an issue for Intel boxes. Like I said, we, we did that offline. Um, that could be done online, probably profitably so. There is an issue with, you know, too much inlining versus too little inlining and your iCache blowout. Uh, and understanding that you've overstretched the bounds and you need to back off inlining and rejet or just relay out, maybe you could pull out of iCache. Uh, iCache About, have another example just pulling from memory, like large large pages versus not. Like, oh could yeah, make, right. Could you make that determination at runtime, for example? Oh, um, I guess so. Way? We we did it sort of offline again, um, because the usual sort of story was a thread allocated through uh, a series, a chunk of memory. And everything in that chunk during a fresh allocation got spread out according to how it were to be allocated and also was fairly busy. So he would want a, a large page. Once he had done GC cycles and compressed the long lived, long touched high value objects into a small space, you kind of wanted to have a smaller TLB. So we had TLBs based on generations in the collector. We had TLB size choices based on stack versus not the stack. Um, but we didn't do an on the fly one, but you could. You'd be looking for, um, you're, you have pressure on the TLB and you have a large page that's not getting enough uses. Can you make it a small page and reserve large pages for other things and vice versa? I have too many small pages that are near each other. And the usual story is that they're not near each other, so it doesn't help you. But if you could arrange for them to be near each other, then you, you get some better locality in a lot of ways. This goes into like, uh, there, there was a famous Java benchmark that fell out of favor a while ago that had the issue that you were basically chasing a, I want to say you were chasing a linked list. It wasn't quite it, but you were chasing a linked list. And if you re, uh, if the garbage collector relayed out the remaining live objects, like any, any given allocation of a, execution of a thread, nine objects out of 10 die young. And the, the, the every 10th object at random lives a long time and maybe gets used a lot. And those get compressed by the garbage collector, but you'd like them to be compressed near each other so that you get cache locality benefits. Um, but when you start daisy chaining from one pointer to the next, so anyone who's running a, um, uh, any of B-tree style large data structure caches and they're walking at B-tree and they're mutating it constantly, they badly want the, the top layers to all be very tightly co-located so they all happily fit in L2 and everyone's happily sharing on them. And what the hell are those objects and where are they and how do you tell that that's what you got? There's probably something you could do there with the perf counters to start diagnosing. If I touch this object, I touch that one, wouldn't it be nice if they're on the same 4K page? Wouldn't it be nice for the same cache line? It's kind so of- Ken, I, I have a question for you. Why would you prefer online um, versus, versus offline? offline? It's because you can get stuff online that's, that's not available offline. You get the, at the moment, 
Like JVM yeah, well, I wanted to extend that question a little bit. Is it because you want auto adjustments? You you want to specify some parameters and you want to have the JVM handle these kind of smart data uh, co-location or whatever? Or is it because you just want to get the information that online uh, diagnostics gives you? So <laughs> is there a further uh, goal for this online that is more to do with uh, AI or, or some kind of simple smarts, right? Um, it, it's, it's, I think the answer is a little simpler than that. It says we don't know what we don't know. So, so the JVM has proven that you can gather cheap, easy stats and JIT code that's of equal or higher quality than offline because you have constant online profiling. So it's all kinds of things that are not constant typically that become a constant uh, at runtime. There are all kinds of things that are effectively a constant uh, that get folded in, including cash, uh, classes for all your call hierarchy stuff. So, so that was a well-diagnosed, well-observed, large, interesting effect. Is there more? That's the open question. Is there something else we can now do where online data trumps offline analysis because it's of the moment? And, and that's, the, that's the open question that I'm sorting looking around for. You know, what's an easy win here? Is there an easy win? Okay, I can play games with iCaches and iCache layout. In some codes, that might be worth more. JVMs have you know code bloat issues sometimes because that's easy to fall into. And that in turn means that iCache layout might have more payout. So maybe there's something there and I'm looking for it. And I'm asking other people look or people are asking to look, but I don't have a, I don't have a, I don't have an agenda in place beyond that. But you have thresholds or alerts or some kind of um, trigger. So, so, so then there's a, the question of how do you implement the thing without falling over? And there's all the usual things with uh, on the, on the fly runtime optimizations. Um, it's easy to fall into potholes and go backwards and blow yourself up and shoot yourself in the foot and all that. So you have to have a standard, good, reasonable fallback position. And then you have, yes, thresholds of various kinds that say, and here we think we can spend some effort and burn some of the mutators execution time in order to get it paid back by optimizing. So I'm gonna stop the mutators, I'm gonna copy the code around to shuffle the iCache, and I'm gonna restart the mutators, and they're gonna lose for the time I stop them and shuffle, and they're gonna win afterwards because it's gonna run faster, and did the win beat the lose? That's the kind of threshold games that are sort of common in the, in the JVM land. I'm running in the interpreter, when is it worth it to stop and jet? Well, these days you got multi-core, so you jet the background, it's not quite so expensive. Um, I'm doing garbage collection. I'm doing incremental new, young gen only at the moment. I'll have a full gen later. I, I'm deciding, do I move these objects and co-locate them? And the garbage collector runs slower because it has to do all this analysis, but the, the mutators run faster because things are cache local or not. And how do I even measure that game, right? So, so I, I, you have to play the game. Yeah, there, there's a game there. When is it worth it? And, and statistically speaking, I am winning, although there's obviously places where I lose and places where I win, you know, in both sides of the coin. If statistically speaking, you win, you know, that's what you're looking for. Well, it's interesting too, because you can actually collect that statistic along with the process itself. So you can actually measure the amount of time you spend jitting and compare that with the amount of time you save. As so, right, well, that, that work's been around for a while. So here's a pothole, if, if I can just get in quickly and then let you guys go. Um, it's like, if you look at um, adaptive sizing algorithms in the JVM right now, they're heavily influenced by allocation rates. Unfortunately, you get into called, uh, you know, certain pathologies where all of a sudden you can't get a high allocation rate and you need more memory. And all of a sudden the collector is deciding, oh, because the allocation rate has dropped, I'm going to take away the memory that we actually need to actually make the situation degenerate even worse, right? Yeah. Um, so, so that's a you know a high level type of pothole that sometimes you fall into when you uh, start trying to use some of these metrics to do things at runtime. So quite often we have to come back in and say like, don't do that. 
So one of the one of the interesting observations at working at the the Azul collector was, of course, the the, the things go through waves and you have spikes. Uh, an allocation rate and the GC bike panics and thinks that, oh my God, I have to get so much free and so fast in order to keep up. So it's runs in high speed panic or not or whatever. These things all fall under a classic control theory. Like anyone who does uh, uh, control systems, analog, electrical, hydraulic, whatever control system theory totally falls into this kind of category. You, you have to have, you know, you have to have a management of over and under dampening of your control signal to your effort. And if you don't, then you can get these things that spiral out of control where that shoves the control too high, too low, too high, too low until it whipsaws and, and, and yeah, you fall into a performance pothole. Um, yeah, there's a control, classic control systems theory going on here uh, for a lot of these heuristics. And if you don't implement them with that in mind, you will totally open yourself up to all kinds of cool <laughs> regressions. There's a monotonicity of performance, if you will, that has a good to be. question that I wanted to get to. Uh, do, is it always that I know better for my application? I mean, I, I think Kurt gave a good example of adaptive sizing and you said control theory. Um, say we perfected control theory, right? The feedback loop, somehow we managed to get to that uh, or stay within the hysteresis or whatever, right? But it is all is it always the notion that i know better that stops us from using ai for these online uh diagnostics oh i don't think anything is stopping us from using ai and i think okay. it's always the case that uh the, the the somebody knows better and sometimes it's the person with the problem in hand and sometimes it's the expert outside so as an implementer, my hope is I know fairly well, statistically speaking, for the broad audience that I'm shipping to, you as an individual with an individual application hand might damn well yes know better. And it sort of has nothing to do with AI. AI is a useful, metric, useful tool for taking large complicated problems and coming up with a you know, reasonable answer. So which AI for tuning of these things might entirely be saying. And is not necessarily uh, counter to control theory. It's just sort of orthogonal. But but if you don't, if control theory is like you know water flow in a pipe. There's physics involved, and you can't escape it. Um, it's nice to say I have a, a very complex, cool AI that does something nifty. Um, I would back that up with a uh, bounds on its behavior that were based on control theory. Because the control theory, like it's like laws of physics, it just trumps, uh, you know, what you do there. Um, but I don't, I don't have a. You, you said AI twice now, so so what what is your take on AI here? Why why are you saying AI? I think because we're looking. So for me to invest in an online diagnostic uh, engine of sorts, or or to make use out of an online diagnostic engine, is to be able to provide that information to something that I have already defined thresholds based on uh, JVM operation or, or say garbage collector, which, which is the simplest, uh, I say simple, but I don't mean simple. I mean, more deterministic in a way. Um, uh, you know, you can change the operation of a garbage collection from a throughput to a latency driven to whatever, right? Uh, and those are deterministic steps, right? that we can take from our data. Because I'm still trying to figure out uh, wins, except for one application where you have a manual, uh, like a person looking at the online data and saying, this is what I'm gonna do for this particular application. I don't think it scales well. Is That's all my, that's my thinking. I'm, I'm very sorry. Um, I missed half of what you said because I'm a grandfather now. I, my phone's lighting up. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's fine. I'm glad that uh, you had something inter interesting to, to, uh, to listen to or attend to. I, so. got, I got baby pictures and... Oh, congratulations. Very, uh, very good news. Yes. Okay. 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 Uh, I'll put the phone down for a second. I'll stare at them offline here. Um, <laughs> yeah. Thanks. 
Uh, there's congrats on the chat. Thank you guys. Um, yeah. Okay, so so say again. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll try to get my head back in here. You're you're talking about AI and online, offline, and, and after so, that, I was just trying to justify the costs of, mm. of online uh, diagnostics and in in the scaling aspect of it, and how to me it seems that. And I'm I'm I may be totally wrong because I'm looking at it from the JVM perspective and or the system perspective. So I, for me, it's always about scale. But I want to hear why people invest in online uh, diagnostics and how do when they say, envision this? When you say costs of online diagnostics, what costs are you referring to? The, the execution cost to the mutator threads? Execution cost, uh, the re, you know, the stopping and redoing stuff or okay, so the moving, even uh, co-location for example, if, you, if you're simply doing co-location, uh, that is expensive as well, right? And from the JVM perspective. Um, so, so here, here's a here's a hypothetical. Uh, you know, what is the what's the break-even point for? I slowed the mutator down by X percent here, and I gained back Y percent there. It's right. sort of self-answering, right? That there's an obvious trade-off, and and once you once you make the payoff, you're done. You, you're winning now. So what is the cost? Well, to collect PMU counters, it's as low as I want to sample, right? So I can drive the cost down to much, much less than a fraction of a percent, and you'll never know that I'm doing PMU profiling, not unless you're doing a super low latency thing. So there's a handful of folks that might care, and everyone else just can't tell that I'm profiling. Okay, fine. So the next thing that happens is, you know, we do this at Azul. We profile all the time. Now it's just a matter of what, how much cost we're willing to put it out in order to, to collect that profiles and can you tell, right? And so as long as I keep the cost of the profiling below some threshold, you have no clue. Furthermore, you have way more costs in the execution, the poor execution of the existing application such that adding 1% here or there, you'll never ever know, but you might be able to use that information to diagnose a problem that gives you a 10X speed up. That kind of crap happens all the time. So these counters, the gathering information is very useful. Automatically uh, uh, using it in an automatic online way requires a lot more engineering effort to avoid the pothole, both of I did the effort to make things better and that cost. And then the other one is I did the effort and I didn't actually win, right? So, so you know, Jittings all has those, uh, has those trade-offs in spades everyone's, you know, uh, unhappy about the jitting speed until it turned out that it didn't really matter anymore and the wind was so big. So I got a huge pushback on JIT speed versus JIT code quality until it was clear that it didn't matter. So I think we're in the same kind of zone here now with a lot of these, what can we do with these counters? I think we can collect them cheap. Now, what can we do with them and what's the cost? I think the cost is low enough to collect. The cost to use them, that's a standard engineering trade-off. I decided to block my iCache, my, my, my code cache, shuffle it, and then unblock it. What did that cost me? What did I gain? Do the math. There's some number where there was a win and there's not a win. Actually, the, the way you explain that makes AI seem perfectly rational for making those decisions because you're gonna see different trade-offs under different workloads with different applications and given a, uh, given a set of, of goals for the AI, you would expect it would be able to uh, meander toward them. Absolutely, I mean, that's my thinking. It's the scale that I think that AI gives you. Uh, but then I, I really wanna hear how people have used online uh, <laughs> diagnostics to improve uh, the, 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 the feedback, right? How has that and how much of an advantage they got just by being there? Being there to uh, when, when wrong things happened or, or not uh, desired things happened. So I've certainly been there when we were diagnosing the, the heuristics that were guiding the garbage collector's execution for instance, it's a concurrent collector, but it's only concurrent if it keeps up. So it has to run, and if it runs while it's running, the mutators pay a cost. 
So th there's a thing where you want it to run just enough to make up to be ready for the next GC cycle before you get there. And then there's some heuristics on when and how fast it runs. And then you have this, people point out, you know, Kirk's point out that you have these spikes in allocation rate and you have to have some reserve floating around that you can you know, apply on the spot and all that kind of stuff. The flip from, I wrote a heuristic to, I wrote a heuristic with control theory was a big one. And it got us over the hump of having a, a reliable, no potholes kind of allocation pattern. So it might not be the most optimal, but it didn't go backwards, if you will. So I think um, I don't have any, any problems with AI in the sense that there are a lot of knobs to turn. And if there's a better way to turn them, I think that's fine. Um, the, the cost is more in my head engineering because almost all these heuristics these days run on background cores that are otherwise idle. So, you know, welcome to the land of multi-core. We got more cores than we need. Um, your mutator's only burning half your cores on your box. So you got, burn, you got cycles to spare. So it's more about how often do you have to stop the mutator to make it wait and screw around before it can go again while you're changing things. That's the engineering cost that you pay the gain is the mutator runs faster. The AI is not in that picture in terms of cost. And the AI guides what happens, but it's not a cost factor. And in fact, you know, most AI algos that I have seen, the execution of the model can be driven really low. There are some models that are expensive, but most models are not. And if you're willing to toss away a tiny bit of fidelity on the more complicated models, you can generally make them really cheap. But you're not winning a Kegel contest with the absolute tiniest epsilon of perfection. You can get a cheap model pretty cheap. The other thing is you can schedule a lot of the analysis for, for less busy times because most of the are bursty. Yeah. Well, or online when there's no requests. Yeah, to right. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. I, as I said, I said offline. You're right. I, I meant. I'm a totally agreeing with you. <laughs> Do later. There, there are idle cycles. <laughs> Has anyone used AI? I, I, I'm... I've talked to people who are tuning JVM flags using. AI style technologies um, uh, for running in the cloud on big, big service piles. I think, I think they're actually more headed for, uh, they're trying to use a substitute for control theory where they have a classic network flow problem. Like any chemical engineer who runs any large refinery plant would smack them around and say, you have a network flow problem, dude, solve it with network flow theory which is well-defined, well-understood, and you know, gets rid of all these funny, weird potholes where this accelerated to that, so that fed back to this, and then your feedback cycle went out of control and you blew out. Um, you know, thinking about garbage collection as a network flow problem, as a pipeline flow problem, like turns you right away into, there's a little bit of control theory, and suddenly like all your feedback cycles that cause oscillations of doom, they go away. There's an easy answer there. So I think that one should be applied to these big clusters of microservices in the cloud. But that's, that's sort of not related. <laughs> Maybe it is related. I don't know. Maybe it's related. It's all performance work. I think Twitter does that, right? They do that command line optimization or whatever, like just jumping. It, uh, it stems from the MIT research on static compilers. And then I forget the person's name. He expanded it to um, this dynamic, um, uh, compilers and I think Twitter built on top of that. Uh, they have a very, uh, they probably have that as a good use case because maybe they are very deterministic in the sense. So I think Kirk would be a better person to to take over here, but I think he just left because he had to go to some other meeting. Um, he, he tackles but, other people's misdefined problems, whereas Twitter's got their own well-understood one. Exactly, exactly. That's that's where you know uh, Kirk's uh, Illuminate tooling. Uh, he should be able to provide more insight. But but the whole multimodal and weird modalities that you have to deal with in real time uh, when you're not Twitter. For example, and Twitter has this too, right? But it's well defined that peaks and stuff like that they they can handle for those. Um, 
is a bigger problem to solve. And I don't know if, and I kind of agree, basically what I'm saying in a long, uh, rounded way is that I agree <laughs> with you, Cliff. <laughs> All right. Well, it's 11.15. Does anyone else want to add anything here or maybe we'll wrap it up? I think we lost Dennis too. Okay. Um, well, this has been very informative for me, certainly. Uh, this is a good conversation. And uh, I, I guess I'm going to call it and I'll throw the video up as soon as Zoom gets done munching it. Um, so it's probably an hour or two. I uh, hope to see people next time. Have a great day, and I have some phone calls to make. Congrats. Bye-bye.